I break in on the 27th verse because of the space of time. Read a few verses. Christ in Pilate's hall. In the 27th verse, 27th chapter of Matthew. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. When they had planted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. They bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they find a man of Serene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. When they were come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. When he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there set up over his head, his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. They that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and build it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priest mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. Father, we look to thee in just a moment of prayer to thank thee for every blessing you so wonderfully poured out upon us. And Lord, we look to thee as needy creatures tonight. We pray you'll bless the teaching of thy word. Anoint us once again, lift us out of ourselves, cause us to be able by the Holy Spirit to apply the words to the needs of the people. Rebuke the enemy of souls. Let men and women be drawn unto thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That 42nd verse, I want to read again and speak tonight from the latter part of that verse, God would direct our attention there. He saved others himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. I want to deal with that last clause. Let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. I'll break bluntly into this message tonight in saying this. This text definitely proves that all compromising deals are based on unbelief. God would draw my attention to this thought tonight, I'm sure, because we're living in a compromising world. And I believe greater so than people really realize. We're in a time when the enemy of souls is working in every way possible against the people of God, those who have a real experience with God, yeah. in one way or another, trying to get you to compromise yeah. just a little bit this way or that. Because, friends, the enemy of souls tonight knows the power there is in the gospel. Amen. He knows the power that's loose in the heart and life of individuals that will be true to God's eternal word. And so he's ever working in one way or another. Amen. Striving to get you and I to compromise. And I just want to repeat again, my friend, this text tonight, if it teaches us nothing else, it teaches us that all compromising deals are based on unbelief. They spoke to Jesus, these religious folks, the scribes and Pharisees, and chief religious leaders of the day. They spoke to Jesus and said, if you're the Son of God, you've talked about saving others. We've heard you say to people, go your way and sin no more. And you spoke about that you came to save sinners. Now if you really had power to save others, save yourself. If you really be the 
Son of God, the King of Israel, come down off the cross and we'll believe. This has been the cry of unbelievers down through the periods of time. And it's still the cry of unbeliever yet tonight. And my friends scattered around over this globe and in our very city and around you and I day after day is men and women who have a religious garb on as much as he's one recognized in the text. But the very attitude of their heart and many times their expression is to get you and I to take down just a little bit and then we'll believe. Friend, we need to realize tonight and learn from the teachings of God's Word that nobody was ever helped to believe by taking down from the standard of God's eternal Word. The enemy of souls is working on every hand. My friend, I get letters from people who are not privileged to set under the truth and many problems come to them and they'll write through the mail and want to know what attitude we need to take towards this. Amen. Maybe a companion is putting a compromising deal right before him. Amen. But the very, when you begin to understand the root of the thing and the foundation of it, it's nothing more, my friend, than to pull the individual down from the standard of holiness that they're living and bring them down and clip their power. May God help us to realize it tonight. I say it's always been a cry of unbelievers. To come down and we'll believe. The religious world has listened to this cry and been affected by it until there's nothing to believe out there but a lie and be damned. The pressure of the people have cried out, come down, take down, take down, until my friend they've taken down, till there's nothing really believe of a soul-saving value out there. As the scripture said, they're left with nothing to believe but a lie and be damned. Man has supposed that my friend brought Christ down from the cross to the level of a good man. Many people teach Christ tonight as a, on the level of a good man and mention such men as George Washington and Lincoln and Luther and Wesley and other great men and place Christ there as an example for men and women to pattern their lives by. The real power of redemption is being lost sight of. I'm here to tell you again tonight, the real power of redemption, my friend, lies in the cross of Jesus Christ. And even if you don't believe it tonight, the devils do and tremble at the real preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ. And that old spirit that wanted to bring him down from the cross back there is still existing in the day and age in which we're living. My friend, even though you may not hear it spoken audibly, the very pressure, the very spiritual pressure that you and I will run into as we endeavor to live for God is to pull us down, ever pull us down to a level of the nominal religious world. I say tonight the cry come down is in direct opposition to the gospel. Jesus said in John 12, 32, If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Amen. Christ sets forth there His plan of redemption and His going to the cross as loosing a lifting power whereby, my friend, He wouldn't be brought down to the level of men, but men would be lifted up to the level of God and to the level of holiness. I want to say tonight, my friend, that the plane of holiness is the lowest place God ever did come. He never was known to come below the plane of holiness, and He never will come below the, below the plane of holiness. Men in all ages have coaxed and begged and prayed for God to come down, for God to come down, but He was never known to come below the plane of holiness. And he never will. Friend, whenever we begin to seek a religion, or when we begin to seek a, a way short of real Bible holiness, we're only deceiving ourselves and wasting our time, and we'll still end up in a lost eternity. There is no God in any religion tonight below the plane of real Bible holiness. God never did, I want to repeat. And he never will come down below the plane of holiness. That's the lowest place he ever came. If we go back and look at old Israel just hurriedly, there Israel failed God. 
They refused his way. They got so far from God they wanted the prophets to spook, speak smooth things. Prophesy the seat. And they got them kind of prophets, if you please. That would prophesy deceit to them. But the scripture said the heavens closed. And for hundreds of years the heavens was closed. Their religion was carried on in darkness. There was no light. There was no power. There was no real God in it. If you look in the 64th chapter of Isaiah, there you hear Israel praying out. They got into deep trouble. They needed God awful bad. And I want to tell you right now, if you don't realize your need of God tonight, just out here a little ways, you're going to see where you need Him. And if you're never waking up to your fact of your need of God, as long as you're in this natural life, when you wake up at the judgment bar and stand there spotted with the sins of your life, with no advocate, no one to plead your cause, you'll feel the need of God then. Israel turned down God. They turned down His way. He was ever leading them up. Ever leading them up. My friend, but they rejected His way. And when they rejected His way, God rejected them. And the heavens were closed. 64th chapter of Isaiah will tell you there beginning in the first verse. If you look there, they got into deep trouble. And they began to pray and plead, Oh, that thou would rend the heavens and come down that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. Brother, there was mountains of difficulty and heartaches of every kind surrounding them on every side. And oh, how they pled that God would come down, that the mountains would uh, flow down in His presence. But He never came down. Somebody said, how come? Because they wouldn't come up. Brother, God will meet us. God ready to start a trip from heaven tonight. And meet you. If you start up, you start down. Amen. Amen. And meet you at a position in Christ Jesus, at the cross of Jesus Christ. And there roll away your burden of sin. But man wants to wallow in his sin tonight. He still wants to find pleasure in his sin. And have God come down in the hog water where he is. And forgive him his sin. He'll never be down there. God closed the heavens up and they remain closed. And they didn't remain closed for a week. They remained closed for hundreds of years. Hundreds upon top of hundreds of years. Amen. Until, my friend, we read over in the New Testament where one appeared. John the Baptist came preaching in the breaking of this gospel day. And he set up a standard of repentance. Amen. He said, people, if you're ever going to get back to God, you're going to have to turn from your sin. This old business of trying to bring God down here, he ain't going to come down here where you're living. If you ever find God, you're going to have to turn from your sin. John preached. And brother, he put the heat on the religious professors. And they got stirred and got mad. But he laid the thing right at the root of the tree. And they turned from him. One day, thank God, right while he's preaching and baptizing, along came Christ. And John said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And Jesus walked up and said, John, I want you to baptize me next. And Jesus said, John said, I can't baptize you. You need to baptize me. Jesus said, Suffer to be so, for it become of us to fulfill all righteousness. John let him down the water, baptized him. When he brought him up, the Spirit of God set on him the form of a dove. And the Scripture said, And the heavens opened unto him. Thank God the heavens that had been closed for hundreds of years opened unto him. And God spoke out of heaven. And he said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. If you want God in your midst, you're going to have to come to the standard of this Son. Amen. Right here's your Savior. Right here's your power. Right here's your example. Friend, I pray God will help us to see tonight how men and women are wasting their time, money, and efforts working at these many brands of religion. Amen. And trying to make people feel that God is working in all things. I'm telling you tonight, the Bible tells us He never came below the plane of holiness. Why, if God was in a lot of places that calls itself churches tonight, He'd come out, He'd come out tainted. Amen. Brother, let me tell you, He wouldn't be a holy God anymore. 
Somebody said, why won't he come down but live below the plane of holiness? He'll lose his holiness. And brother, whenever you live below the plane of holiness, you lose your holiness. Don't you pay no attention. That old preacher that's filled with that damnable doctrine of eternal security and your wants and grace, you're always in grace. You're only in grace as you stay on the plane of grace. You step below the plane of grace. Brother, you're doomed for a devil's hell. The Bible said the second state is worse than the first. These Baptists running over the country and telling people they'll never backslide. What are you going to do with that scripture that speaks about the second state being worse than the first? They throw the second state out the window. Amen. I'm here to tell you tonight that, that Jesus ordained a plan whereby he can put you in the Father's hand and there's no man can put you out. But brother, it was your free moral agency that brought you in there and your free moral agency can take you out. Amen. No other man can put you out, but you can walk out. You can sin against God. You can sin against the grace of God and fall from the plane of holiness and be lost. God said he looked down upon Christ. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. Now you think with me a little bit and I'll try to hurry as we look on our text tonight. These religious folks that wouldn't believe him. They was the ones that put him on the cross. Now you think a little bit how unfair this is. They put him on the cross. They was the ones that stirred up Pilate. They was the ones that pitted the minds of the people. And then after they got him on the cross, stood out there and wanged their heads and said, If you're really the Son of God, come down and we'll believe. Brother, I want to make this thing look so bad. When anybody comes up compromising with you, you'll mark it as the devil in unbelief. All compromising comes about by unbelief. Amen. And nobody was ever made a believer by compromising with him. You hold those two thoughts tonight as we go along. Stop and think a minute. They said, come down from the cross and we'll believe. Stop a little. If they had listened, now listen. If Christ had listened to the whims of the world and come down, stop and think. Not only they wouldn't have believed, but you and I wouldn't have believed. Why? There'd been nothing to believe in. There'd been no salvation. The cross would have been a laughing stop. It almost is anyway today because it isn't being preached in the right way. The cross would have been a laughing stop. We would be yet in our sins and darkness. There had been no fountain opened up. You can see the devil in this thing. Brother, he knew the power there was in the cross. Don't you think he hadn't studied Old Testament prophecy? Jesus said he believes and trembles. He knowed the power there was in the cross. My friend working through these low-down religionists, if you allow me to call them that, brother, he was wanting to bring him down off the cross. You come down there. Don't you die. Don't you stay there till you die. You come down, we'll believe. Brother, if he'd have listened to him and come down, somebody said, well, he didn't. Don't worry about it. I'm merely putting an if in there so you and I will know how to deal with these things that wants to bring us down. The church of God is the body of Christ now. And God has put her in exalted position. Isaiah said he put her in the top of the mountain. Babylon never did like that. No. She wants us down on one of the hills. But God has established her in the top of the mountain. Amen. Far above all the hills, Isaiah the second chapter said. And that same power is noticed. Jesus said, if we're the city set up on a hill, we can't be here. Brother, our light will shine. It'll reach the world. So the enemy of souls knows there's only one hope. Try to get us come down. Try to get us come down. It would have been disastrous if Christ had come down. There had been no fountain opened up. Brother Zachariah spoke about this gospel day. He said there'd be a fountain opened up in the house of Jerusha and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. That fountain was opened up when they pierced Christ's side and out flowed blood and water. My friend, the fountain was opened up, a fountain of redemption. Thank God the blood flowed first. Thank God to cancel every sin we ever commit. 
When we come in old time repentance, humble ourselves before God, the blood washes us clean from every sin we ever commit. Then thank God, following the blood, outflowed the water. And the scripture said that water is the water of life. Jesus said if you drink of that, you'd never thirst again. But if you take one drink of it, thank God it'd be a well of water within you, springing up into everlasting life. Not a thought, my friend, of sinning and not being guilty of it, but a thought of living everlastingly for God, consistently free from sin. In John, the third chapter, in the 14th verse, as we think about the cross, we think of some teachings there that Jesus set forth in that 14th verse, and I must hurry. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He set the gospel forth in no uncertain terms. Man today has twisted this thing around and added to it and taken away from it until they boldly say, that's your way, but we've got another way. Christ must be lifted up as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness. And I'll not preach on that very long, but think a minute. How was it lifted up? It was lifted up as the only way, the only cure for man. No confusion here. If you go back to the 21st chapter of Numbers in your mind a little bit and look, Israel tempted God. They murmured and complained against God until they tempted God. And when God got tempted to a certain degree, they took him so far that his wrath got stirred. And he sent fiery serpents into the camp. And every person was bit with a fiery serpent, certain death followed. May his dying life fly. Moses prayed unto God. My God, in the midst of your wrath, remember mercy. Won't you have mercy? Isn't there some way out? I know your wrath is spoken. These fiery serpents are turned loose. And everybody gets bit, is dying. God said, Moses, make a serpent, make a fiery serpent of brass. Put it up on a pole. And everybody looks on that by faith, they'll live. Now come on. I want you to stop and think a little bit. Jesus' own words here in John 3 14 was just like the serpent lifting up in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. First, he must be lifted up as the only way. I'd like, to, I'd like to know what good it had been the DDs and double LDs to set up business back there. Amen. Now, come on. I want you to see how foolish false religion is today. Jesus Christ is the only way. He lifted up like the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness. Why, men could have set up shop on every corner. Amen. And told those people that was dying from being bit with a fiery serpent, all you got to do is just let me sprinkle a little holy water on you. Or bring that child around, let me confirm him. He won't die, but they'd have died anyway. Brother, God set a way, and that was the only way for him to live. And just as true, my friend, Jesus Christ went to that cross as the only cure for man's sin. You can go to the Pope and the priest to your blue in the face. Amen. You can get baptized head first, feet first, as many times as you want. You can sign all the cards till you wear your hand out. But until you come to the cross of Jesus Christ and see one there suffering and wallowing in his own blood for your sins. And take faith that he died for thee and confess your sins unto God. You'll never be cured of the sin business. We're in synthetic days when there's a lot of synthetic things and even synthetic religions and they got synthetic Pentecost. Amen. For every real thing God's got, the devil's got something just as good at. But brother, these things just as good at is not curing the people. It's leaving them bound in the fetters of sin. All they've done was take on a profession, but they're still dead. Still living, dead, in trespassing sin. Now somebody said, Brother Wilson, I wouldn't mind hearing you if you didn't talk so much about other religions. A woman got awful mad. I had me out in California for that. She come back at the door. First said she wanted to ask me forgiveness for having an attitude toward me. Well, I said, what would you have an attitude toward me for? Something you said. Well, I said, if you tell me what I said, if I can take it back, I would. 
And she said, will you speak against other religions? Well, I said, doesn't the Bible? Well, it may, but I don't want you to. I said, sister, are you clear? No, I ain't right. Well, I said, you ain't no shape to judge me. You ain't no shape to judge me. Brother, I'm here to tell you tonight that this old thing has gripped the people. Till many, and I wasn't out in Babylon, I was preaching in the church of God, and this is supposed to be one of the good members. I'm telling you, I, somebody said, what'd you preach on the next service? It's a crying shame when you preach on Babylon and Zion whines. Amen. Amen. And it is. You can go over the country and begin to preach the old time truths of God's eternal word that delivered a people out of Babylon and made them a separate people for God. You'd be surprised if people get their feelings hurt, even though you give it to them right out of God's eternal word. Well, somebody said, what are you doing anyway? Brother, when I start in on false religion, all I'm doing is clearing off a place to lift up Jesus Christ. Amen. You can't lift him up in the midst of all this confusion. Amen. You try to lift him up in the midst of this religious confusion, and people think he's just a Christ among Christ. Brother, let me tell you, the old Pope of Rome was so deceived the multitudes and then carried right on down to Protestantism, and the people are boasting and saying, our way just good as your way. Brother, we're going to have to come back to the Bible way. Jesus Christ was lifted up as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, as the only killer. God's command was look and live or refuse to look and die. And that's the way it is yet tonight. And I want to say, my friend, you're not going to be able to find salvation by looking at Jesus as a baby in the manger. That's why you don't see me putting out no nativity scenes. They won't help nobody. Thank God for the baby. But if he just stayed a baby, he'd never got nothing done. But I'm glad he grew up to be a man. Amen. Brother, he boldly went to Calvary and let him nail him to that cross. And there became sin for me. I'm telling you, you can't find salvation by seeing a Christ, amen, in the manger. Or a Christ in the tomb. Or a Christ out of the tomb. If you ever find real salvation, you're going to have to go to the cross of Calvary and see the Christ that loved you so much that he wallowed in his own blood to save your soul from sin. Oh, people today say, Brother Wilson, you can preach Christ without the cross. And we've got so nice, you know, at least about some things. That always was amazing to me how people can talk so loose about other things. Then when it comes to religion, they want to be very careful. Don't make anything bloody. Or... And so they have a way of presenting Christ, amen, and stay away from the bloody picture of him hanging upon the cross. But I want to tell you today, even though it is a bloody sight for mankind, we need to see him there just as sure that we're here, writhing in his own blood, Amen. becoming sin for us. As Paul said, he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We still need to go to the cross and see him hanging there. The cross of Jesus Christ is the hub on which the world turns to God. The cross of Jesus Christ is the hub on which the world turns to God. Somebody said, John 8 and 32 said, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Sure it will, but the truth tells you about the cross. <laughs> yes, it does. The truth tells you about the cross. Just as sure as we're here. Paul said in Galatians 6, 14, Paul said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me. And I'm crucified under the world. What do you mean crucified? Dead. Inactive. The cry come down, my friend. And I hope you'll draw a circle if you don't mind marking your Bible. Around those two words, come down. The cry come down is heard on many lines of truth. And what isn't heard with an oil voice? is felt by the pressure of the age. 
Brother, we feel today as ministers of the gospel, we feel a great cry to come down from the message of whirling. Somebody said, Brother Wilson, I ain't saying come down. Well, I want you to think with me a little bit. When you fail to dress and fix yourself like a saint, by your actions, you're saying come down. There's more ways to feel the pressure against the gospel than by oral conversation. We're in a spiritual warfare. The very spirit of people will raise up against God's eternal word today. And I want to say again, when we refuse to obey the teachings of God's word and walk in the light of it, by our very action, we're putting a vote in against it. Come down from the message of worldliness and we'll believe. We got some people who want to visit next week. Just like that. Somebody say, what's happened? Got offended over the message of worldliness. Their attitude is when I talk on the telephone to them, if you just, just don't get so excited over little things. We'll believe. Friend, I want to set you straight again tonight. There's no little things and big things with God. When God reveals anything to you, I said when God reveals. Not when the preacher preaches it or somebody exhorts about it. But when God reveals something to you, it's light. And when it's light, my friend, we'll either walk in that light or we'll go into the dark. Makes no difference who we are. Friend, it's a shame and a disgrace. But you go over the land tonight... Somebody said, well, Brother Wilson, how come you have to preach so much against worldliness? Because there's so much of it. Amen. Because there's so much of it. I tell them to get all the squirrels out of the woods and I'll quit banging. You travel the country today, many people that once held a standard against worldliness. Even in the holy, holiness movement. Thank God for good people out there that I believe love God. But I'm just as sure as I'm standing in this pulpit, if they keep walking the highway of holiness, they're going to come to Zion. Amen. Amen. we got a message that they need to hear. They'll come to Zion. But many of them, my friend, that once held a high standard of holiness, it's a shame yeah. Yeah. to look upon them today. Yeah. Somebody said, well, Brother Wilson... What about it? I say there's a great pull today to come down from the message of hope. This trail has been followed by thousands, lowering the standard of the gospel. Never makes more believers. I had to learn that in the early days of my ministry. Amen. And I believe every other preacher is going to have to learn that if he's going to stand for truth. Lowering the standard of the gospel never makes any more believers. You'll get a congregation loaded down with hypocrites, professors, but lowering the standard of the gospel will never make any more believers. Many scriptures have been wrested to man's own damnation. Several scriptures that are actually given to win more people to God have been put in a place and held in a place of fear of losing people. Amen. I want you to see the devil working through this thing. Very scriptures that God gave you to bring people out in the truth. And scriptures that if individuals will obey, they'll win their companion for God. The devil has so twisted them around and put them in a place of fear. That if we preach on these, we'll drive people away. Yeah. And if I measure to this, my husband will leave me. Yeah. Brother, the Bible tells us they was given to win people. Yeah. Yeah. Win people. Oh, how this old spirit tonight, and as soon as I mention worldliness, it gets tight. Yeah. How this old spirit tonight wants you to come down. Yeah. Come down. Let's look here a little bit. 
Let's look here a little bit. Now, I wouldn't have begun to punch at something without explaining it. I don't believe in doing that. Getting up and just saying people going to hell for wearing this and that. Let's teach the Bible or not mention it. In 1 Peter, the third chapter, let's look tonight. While we're preaching on coming down. 1 Peter, the third chapter, what do you say? Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the word, now dealing with unsaved companions, if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won. Now that isn't winning your husband too, you already got him. He's speaking of winning to the Lord. That all they may also without the word be one. How? Well, how are you going to win them if you can't get them out to hear the Bible? By the conversation of the wise. Amen. While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, real godly fear, Amen. whose adorning let it not be, that outward adorning of the plating of the hair, the wearing of gold, or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great Christ. Now this scripture tonight, let's just leave it where it was directed. This scripture tonight is directed to married people. Likewise, you wives, be in a subjection unto your own husband. Somebody said, I ain't going to be in subjection to mine. He ain't a Christian. Well, that's the kind we're talking about. Amen. 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 Yeah. Well, that's what it says. Yeah. Be in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the word, yeah. he got one and won't obey the word. Yeah. They also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wise, yeah. while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Amen. First thing I want to know, or I want to say tonight to any of you people who want to win your companions, watch your talk. When I say that, I know very well you're not going to be cussing and swearing and telling dirty jokes. You'll lose that kind of tongue when you're born again and get a clean one. Well, somebody said, well, what do you mean then watch your conversation? Well, he brings it down plainer while they behold your chaste conversation. Coupled with fear. First thing, if you want to win that companion, Peter said, is be careful of your conversation, or a better translation says conduct. Make sure there's reverential, godly fear in your life. Brother, if you live with godly fear, you start to build a respect for God up in that companion's heart. Amen. Now he come on down and he said, Whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning, the plating the hair, the wearing of gold, or putting on of a pearl. Uh -huh. Now let's get right into it. The Bible condemns gold for adorn. Yeah. Anywhere that gold is of any use, the Bible doesn't condemn it. Yeah. Let's stick to the Bible. Amen. It said, the, Whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning or the plating of the hair or the wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. Amen. The Bible does not condemn gold for use, merely for adornment. Amen. Somebody said, what's the adornment mean? Well, it has no use. Amen. You had a tooth that needed to be filled and you could afford to have it done, I suppose gold would be as good a thing as you could put in it. And you can think of anything else that gold needs to be used for, the Bible doesn't condemn it. It condemns it for adornment, that which has no use. Amen. Amen. Well, somebody said, Brother Wilson, if the Bible condemns gold for adornment and that it has no use, how are we going to draw the line? Well, we don't have to draw it. God already drew the line. All we have to do is walk. Now let's hold still and go right into Scripture. Rings of all kind, finger and ear, and nose. I haven't saw too much of that in America yet. A little bit. 
But rings of all kind, if you study in the Bible, came out of Egypt yeah. or heathen. Yeah. Amen. Back in Exodus, when Israel was down there, you know, and those people had overworked them and hadn't paid them, God is a just God and He squares up the record. And he said, now we're going out of here tomorrow. I'm going to move on the hearts of the Egyptians. You buy all you can. Buy their earrings and finger rings and their jewels. Israel didn't have any. Buy their finger rings and earrings and their jewels. And then when we go out, we're going to take them out with us. Why, somebody said, would God do a thing like that? He not only would, he did. Brother, they owed Israel wages and God straightened them out. Straighten the wages out before he left. So out of there they come. Somebody said, well, what was he going to do with all that gold? Remember, he was going to go right over here in the middle of the wilderness and build a tabernacle. And there was instruments for the tabernacle to be made out of gold. He had Israel carrying them with him. But you know what happened? They wasn't but just a few days out till somebody tried one of them in their ears. And they got them on their fingers. Got them in their nose. So there's a sight. They got up so far and Moses went up in the mountain to hear from God. And he didn't come down as soon as they ought. You read in the 32nd verse, they got to Aaron and said, This Moses, we don't know where he is. You get up and take over. And so as soon as he took over, they said, we got to have something to worship we can see. So Mo, Aaron said to him. Somebody said, how do you know they had that jewelry on? He said, get your wives and your daughters, and I hate to say this, but it's in there, and your sons, and have them pull the earrings out of their ears. That's how I know they had them on. You can't pull them off if you didn't have them on. Have them pull those earrings off their ears. And he brought them and molded that golden cat. I'll follow right on a little bit. Over in Isaiah, the third chapter, you could follow right down through. If it wasn't so late, we wouldn't take such big jumps. But uh, this is not my last thought tonight. In Isaiah, the third chapter, now let's, let's study God's Word together. In Isaiah, the third chapter, there are the prophet talking of conditions that got a hold of this. He said in the third chapter of Isaiah, in the 16th verse, Moreover, the Lord said, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, that's a million miles from being humble. Cause the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go and making a tingling with their feet. Therefore the Lord will smite them with a scab of the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion and the Lord will discover their secret part. He'll discover where the real trouble is. It's down in here. Amen. And in that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and their calls and round tires like the moon and the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers and the bonnets and the ornaments and the legs and the headbands and the earrings and the rings and the nose jewels. Yes. It's going to be a day. Somebody said, well, what day is that? Well, you back up to the first chapter of Isaiah and read clear through. He's talking about this gospel day beginning A.D. 33, when God was going to take away the bravery of this condition. Now somebody said, Brother Wilson, you said that God did not condemn gold, whether it's use, you merely, the Bible said it was for adornment. That's right. And there's no ring of any kind that has any use. No. Now, don't nobody faint. It's hot in here tonight. But I want to preach about this coming down business. Somebody said, Brother Wilson, it isn't necessary. We're the saints. You don't have to keep preaching on this. Well, I tried to tell a fellow that, that Paul Peter said, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, even though you already know it, I'm going to stir up your pure mind and way of remembering. Now, listen. Any ring that we wear has no use. I'll speak with all kindness and with all the love. I'll even keep from raising my voice. Let's stop and consider here a little bit. 
Let's just go to the top of the ladder. Most people will pretty well peel to the Bible till it gets down the wedding band. And they say, I got to have that. Now let's just study in God's eternal word tonight. The wedding ring had its real beginning in papalism. I want to show you by the Bible tonight that when you wear the wedding band, you're not following the lamb, you're following the pope, following the beast. That teaching never came out of the Bible. You go back in the Old Testament and you'll find back there in the days of bigamy and polygamy, God let them put a band around their ankle. Remember, there was a double standard for man and woman. The woman couldn't speak in public. A man couldn't make a move in public. So they put a band around her ankle because a man could have just many wives as he could afford. Into the days of paganism. Still existed in the days of the early ministry of Jesus Christ. Now when papalism came into being... Rome changed from a pagan state to a papal state. Somebody said, well, you get this part of the information. You go down to the library tomorrow and get a, in any book you want that deals with the wedding ring in custom, and they'll all tell you the same thing. Rome, when it changed from its pagan state to a papal state, took the band off the ankle and put it on this finger. And the reason they put it on this finger, I wonder if you know why you wear it on this finger. How come you don't wear it on your thumb? Why somebody said, don't be silly. Well, I ain't being silly. How come you wear it here? History tells you they didn't understand the anatomy of the body. And they thought there was a spatial vein led from that finger right to the heart. But we've lived long enough to find out that there's a vein going from every one of our fingers to us. So they took that band off the ankle and put it on this thing. That same history book will tell you that the Christians never won till after A.D. 300 when the apostasy took place. Brother, that teaching of the wedding ring and that custom was carried right on over through Protestantism until preachers today boldly put it on in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. They better go take it off for Judgment Day. Ain't a preacher in the country got a right to put a ring on a woman's hand in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Somebody said, how do you know? Do you think that God's divided? Do you think you give a preacher commission to put a ring on you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and another preacher a commission to preach it off of you? The Word of God teaches against you. Gold for adornment has no use. Now, just the other day, I mentioned this. Maybe it was in California. I don't know. But I'm up to them kind of tricks, especially when God lays it on my heart and makes me feel it's really needed. And somebody said, Brother Wilson, you're just after me tonight. No, I ain't after you. If you don't feel nothing, there ain't nothing after you. If you feel something, God's after you. I ain't after nobody. Amen. But it happened out there just about the same as it does everywhere else. Friend, let me tell you, all it takes, a preacher don't have to get in the pulpit and put his approval on these things. All you got to do is just silence. And you know what you have? You didn't realize this morning, and I didn't either until after the service is over, but the pastor one of the biggest movement churches in California was sitting right down there, and that was his wife beside her with chandeliers on and That's what you end up with. Just silence. Brother, I'm telling you, the very pull of the world is strong. And it's having such a downward pull that it's affecting religious bodies all over the world. And brother, it's going to take effort on your and my part in the midst of this damnable condition to raise up a standard for God. Isaiah still says, go through, go through the gates. Gather out the stones. Lift up a standard for the people. Amen. And the Bible standard has never changed. Well, this lady asked the question, like they usually do, when you begin to preach about the wedding ring, 
Somebody said, Brother Wilson, I wish you hadn't said that. You hear the preach about the wedding ring, and they say, well, what about the prodigal? Father put a ring on his hand. That's what it said. That's what it said. But let's analyze it. It wasn't a class ring. He wasn't graduating. He's coming back from the hog pen. It wasn't a Masonic ring. He wasn't joining the Masons. He's coming back from the hog pen. It wasn't a wedding ring. He wasn't getting married. He was coming back from the hog pen. Well, somebody said, what kind of a ring was it? A signet ring. How you know? Back there, they didn't have bank accounts like some people have now. They had a different way of doing business. Every member of the family wore a signet ring. Amen. And you could do business for the family by dipping that ring in wax and signing the document. You read up in the Old Testament when Joseph was so exalted by God though he was second in command of Egypt and he'd done such a good job running the country that Pharaoh took his ring off and put it on Joseph's hand. He said, man, you take over the affair. Now here was the prodigal that had been away. That's a, that's a parable. That's a lesson to it. That's a parable. That ring was a symbol of something. What was it? The prodigal had went away and wasted his substance. In riotous living, he come back and said, I'm no more worthy to be your son. But thank God the Father had mercy on him. Put a kiss of forgiveness on his cheek. Put the best robe on him. Killed the fatted calf. And said, put a ring on his finger. Let him do business for the family just like he always did. Because he was dead, but now he's alive. Amen. So we need to realize tonight, my friend, that the Bible deals with gold for adornment, that which has no use. Somebody said, well, how's anybody going to know I'm married? What's your mouth for? You women have been loose for a long time. You know that. You can talk now, can't you? Now, some of you are looking down the floor and humping up, saying, hurry up, Brother Wilson, now. I'm trying to suffer till you get through. Well, ain't no need of that. What did I say a little bit ago? Amen. If God don't reveal this as truth, you ain't got a thing in the world to worry about. And if He does reveal this truth, you got everything in the world to worry about. Amen. Somebody said, our preacher don't teach it. Well, your preacher ain't going to judge you. John 12 and 48 said, He that rejecteth my words and receiveth not me hath one that judgeth him in the last day. The word I have spoken unto him, the same were judging in the last day. So Peter said to the wise, not to wear gold for adornment. Well, somebody said, Brother Wilson, why don't you go on? Well, I could go right on. On that thought, but our time getting away. How about painting? Well, you look through your Bible and you'll see where it's listed. You show me one place where a person that believed in holiness or good morals ever was in the Bible. See, we get our customs from somewhere. Amen. We get our customs from somewhere. You read back in 2 Kings, maybe the ninth chapter. That's the first place it's listed in the Bible. Old Jezebel. She'd killed off a good part of the prophets and was after Jehu. And the scripture said she painted her face and tired her head and sat in the upstairs window and hollered at him. You know who she was. But old Jehu was a man of God. He sent some men up to throw her out the window. He fell on the street and was burst to the sun. Turn to Ezekiel, the 23rd chapter. Lord, it's getting tight. Ezekiel, the 23rd chapter. When Israel, or when Jerusalem and Judah had failed God, just as I told you in the beginning of the message, they backslid off of Him. And here God set up a, here God set up a prophetic picture of a hola and a hola bar. Judah and Jerusalem. He'll tell you who they are. He got down to the 40th verse and he tells them what they've done. And furthermore, you've sent for men to come from afar and unto whom a messenger was sent. 
And lo, they came. And when thou did, and for whom thou did wash thyself, and paintest thine eyes, and deckest thyself with ornaments, and set upon a stately bed and a table prepared before, whereupon thou hast set mine incense and my oil. And he goes on to tell you that Israel or Jerusalem and Judah were playing the part of whoredom. And here he pictures those two a people as uh, two women and how they left the position that God had ordained. Amen. They were no longer being the bride of God, but they were out here playing the harlot condition. And he said, you painted your eyes and your face. Oh, may God help us to see it. Ezekiel, the 23rd chapter, tells us the same thing. Jeremiah, the 4th chapter, speaks of the same thing. I just add on to that tonight that anything veneered is cheap. And there's no need of painting because you can't make yourself look anything more like yourself. Whenever I go to painting myself up, I'd be right sure telling you that I didn't enjoy myself the way I was. Oh, I preached on the camp meeting one time and the preacher got up next and said, I just don't agree with the message. He said, I think if an old barn needs a little paint, you ought to paint it. Somebody said, what would you say? Well, I got a chance to say something. And I said, if I'd have called you women an old barn, I'd have been in trouble. And I said, if an old barn needs paint, you paint it. But don't be painting up the temple of the Holy Ghost. That body belongs to God if you're consecrated. Somebody said, now, Brother Wilson, you're going to take us too far. No, I'm not going to take you too far. You turn over in 1 Timothy, the second chapter, in the ninth verse. There you'll read about modest apparel. It's still a necessity. And I want to say tonight, amen, when people claim to be children of God and especially members of the church of God yeah. and won't wear their dresses and clothes in a decent way, yeah. you're by your actions saying, come down. Amen. Come down from the stand of the God. Yeah. Somebody said, I don't believe it's that way. God will hold you that way at the judgment. Yeah. Yeah. God will hold you that way at the judgment. Amen. I don't want to make a hobby of any one of these things, but once in a while we need to teach them. Now let's come a little farther. This same spirit of come down is saying come down from the message of unity. And we'll believe. Contrary to the Bible, John 17 and 21, Jesus said, Sanctify them through the truth. Thy word is truth, that they may be one, that the world might believe. The only hope of the world believing is God's people being one. But the cry is today, come down from that message and we'll believe. It's sad to say, but too many have come down from it. We need to be wise tonight. That come down spirit only wants to slow us in our work on the wall of Jerusalem. You turn with me just a couple scriptures here in Nehemiah and I'll be through. Now let's keep smiling. I haven't said one thing to hurt you. In Nehemiah, the fourth chapter, I want to repeat. That spirit that calls you down from the message of unity is doing nothing more than try to hinder the work on the wall. We're building for God. And he turn it. You turn to the fourth chapter of Nehemiah, and let's read a few verses here. Here's a perfect type. When God called Nehemiah to go back and rebuild the wall after Israel had been carried away to Babylon, a perfect type of the rebuilding of the evening light, church for God. He tells us here in the fourth chapter of Nehemiah, but it came to pass when Sam Ballot heard that we built the wall, he was wroth and took indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heap of the rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was buying. And he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he'll even break down their stone wall. Hear, O our God, 
for we are despised and turn their reproach upon their head and give them for a prey in the land of captivity and cover not their iniquity. Let their sin be blotted out from before thee for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So built we the wall and all the wall was joined together under the half thereof and for the people had a mind to work. Now it came to pass that when Samballot and Tobiah and the Arabians and Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and the breaches began to be stopped, they were very wrong. See, their first move was, you can't get the breaches out. Well, somebody said, what are you doing tonight anyway? I'm building the wall. The teaching of God's eternal word takes the breaches out. Their first cry was, you'll never get the breaches out that way. That work you're doing, if a fox would bump into it and knock it over, well, I saw a few foxes bump their brains out. I saw foxes come right in this assembly and they went out. And the wall ain't knocked over yet. Amen. So he kept right on building. Somebody said, how could you build with that going on? The people had a mind to work. So they kept right on building the wall. Pretty soon, what do you know, the breaches was out. Go right back and get the type. How do you build the wall? With the straight preaching of God's eternal word. The way you build the walls of the church of God. Brother, it'll take the breaches out. Amen. And pretty soon all the breaches was out. The scripture said. No old Sam Ballard got mad. They is very raw. And so they called a conspiracy. Oh, how I looked at this in years past. Listen to this. And so the breaches began to be stopped. Then they were they very raw and conspired all of them together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Now here's your come down business. Just one thing in mind, to hinder our progress for God. So they conspired all of them together to come and fight against Jerusalem and hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God. Come on, church. And set a watch against them night and day because of them. Church of God, that's what we need to do tonight. Brother, there's sand ballots on every side. They don't like to see the walls of Jerusalem rebuilt. They don't like to see the truth go forth and close the breaches there. We need to do just what ancient Israel did. Set a prayer and set a watch. Amen. Watch for these fellows that want to hinder the work. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. I'll stop and think a little bit. They set a conspiracy to fight and hinder. That ninth verse gives us our secret of defense. Set a prayer and set a watch or watch and pray. You really want to build the church. You really want to build the walls of Jerusalem. Now go to the 6th chapter and you'll see the devil's next approach. And I'll be through. I'm going to quit. The 6th chapter of Nehemiah. Now it came to pass when Sam, Ballad, and Tobiah, and Jeshem, the Arabian, and the rest of her enemies, heard that I had built the wall and there was no breach left therein, though at the time I had not set up the doors, the gates, Sam, Ballad, and, and Geshem, and sent unto me and saying, Come down now and let us meet together in some one of the villages on the plain of Ono, but they thought to do me mischief. Somebody said, what did Nehemiah say? They said, come on down, meet us on the plains of Ono. But Nehemiah said, oh no. Amen. So he said, I sent a messenger unto them. Somebody said, where are you getting at? The first thing people will do will belittle the work of the church. They'll belittle your message. They'll say it's foolishness. That'll drive people away. You can't build a church that way. But after they stand back and watch a church being built by the sound preaching of God's word, then the next move is, come down here now. We believe we're wrong about you. Come on down here on the plains of Oh No. Let's meet in one of the villages and talk this thing over. But old Nehemiah said, and I say the same thing. Oh no. And what did he give for a reason? 
the same reason I give time and time again and you ought to give. I'm doing a great work and I can't come down. Because if I come down while I'm down there, the work will have to stop. And that's exactly what they wanted him to come down for. You read the rest of the chapter. They knew they couldn't budge old Nehemiah, but they knew all the time they had Nehemiah and the men down on the plain of no mo. Oh no, thrashing this thing around. The work wouldn't go on on the wall. We need to be wise tonight. As old Nehemiah was. So he said, I sent him a messenger unto them. Now let me show you one more work here. It's so true to condition. Now I sent a messenger unto them. Nehemiah 6 and 3 saying, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. <laughs> then sent Sam Ballad his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. I know what them is. Now let's read Wherein was written, it's reported among the heathen, and the Geshmu said, that the Jews think to rebel, and for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king according to these words. There you are. They charge you with an independent spirit. Amen. He wrote him the fifth letter and said, I know why you're building the wall now. You want to build you up a city and you want to be king, Lord. See, it's pretty hard to do anything that isn't already written in the Bible. Right, let's read a little more. Let's read a little more. Think to rebel, for which cause you build the wall, that thou mayest be their king, according to these words. And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, This is a king in Judah. Now shall it be reported to the king according to these words. Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. Ah, uh, here's Nehemiah's answer, and I'm going to quit. Then I sent unto him, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. For they are all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work, that it be not done. That's all you're doing this for, trying to scatter that thing among the people and kill the effect so their hands would be slackened toward the building. Amen. Let's read it. Now therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hand. That's what the church needs to pray for today. Right in the midst of all of these conditions. And amen. This admonition come from every side. People want us to come down from building the walls in the way they need to be well. Brother, they're trying to weaken our hand. They're trying to kill influence. They're trying to make the people daunted from the task. We need to pray as old Nehemiah did. Lord, strengthen my hand. What do you mean, strengthen my hand? Lord, strengthen my hand that I may be able to build greater. Higher. Somebody said, are you talking about lowering the standard? I'm searching God's Word to find a higher one. I could find a scripture in there that would teach us definitely to take off our shoes and go barefooted. Brother, let me tell you, we'd be barefooted in a week or ten days. I'm telling you, I, I'm seeking a higher standard. Why? The higher the standard, the closer heaven you get. The higher standard, the more power it go. I told people on the West Coast, and I'll tell it on the East Coast, if the Lord lets me go there next week, you show me one compromiser. Show me one person that's digressed from God's eternal truth and the one truth they once walked in and got power with God today and I'll take my message back. But everyone that ever compromised from God's truth lost their hold on God and lost their power with God. We need to pray, oh God, strengthen our hands. Give us a greater standard. We're consecrated to all you've showed us. Show us more. Get to the place old Isaiah said where the saints seek after truth and seek after judgment. Amen. Told Brother Wells in the driveway yesterday. I couldn't sleep much the other night. I didn't sleep hardly any last night. I walked all night. Somebody said, how come? Brother, let me tell you when I can think of the picture over this world and the thing that's happening and, and people just calling from this way and that. I went home Wednesday night. Didn't go home. 
because I was called to help with Dale Green. That boy was bound with the worst spirit I've ever seen. Maybe about 1.30. Got him delivered. Thank God he was as meek as a lamb. You know he is because he wanted to go to revival with his daddy and mommy. Just get out of the trailer and go with him. He like a lamb. I got home about 1.30 and the phone rang as soon as I got there. And the woman kept asking questions. What are we going to do about this? That and the other from up uh, by Detroit. I looked at the clock and it was 2.30. I said, my Lord, sister, who's going to help pay for this phone bill? It wasn't on my phone. It was hurt. I said, I'll have to send you money. We've been on here an hour. Yes, but I ain't through yet. Brother, let me tell you, there's problems, there's burdens. Our world is waxing worse and worse. The tide of this old world's coming in, and it's swallowing up people. Honest hearts is trying to keep themselves clear and above it, and many of them don't know which way to turn. My God help us uh, to raise up a standard. Give them something to look at. Give them something to shoot at. Or they sink in despair. I told Brother Wells, yesterday in the driveway that I couldn't sleep the other night and thinking on the bed I never just had thought of this before but you know what God showed me the rich man down in hell woke up asking Lord won't you have mercy on my brother have mercy on me have mercy on my brother now the sixth chapter of Revelation shows us the saints over in heaven and when he opened up there and looked, what were they asking for? Lord, how long before you put judgment? Come on, you read it. How long? We got to wait before you put judgment on them. Judge our blood on them that dwell on the earth. There's the true condition, friend. The saints who want judgment. The hypocrites want mercy. I say, why do you call that man a hypocrite? Brother, he had an angel laying at his door. Every time he went by, he wiped his robes on the gospel. Every time he went in and out that house, he had a chance to get saved. God had Lazarus laying right at his door. Same, same my friend, and he'll be judged the same as if an angel from heaven was stood at his door every day. But he passed up the gospel. How come? He was faring too well. That eat, drink, and be merry spirit that's got the world had him. What have I got to think about eternity? I'm thinking too much about today. He woke up in a lost eternity. He's been there for thousands of years, and his torment has never ceased. And it never will cease, only long enough for him to come to the judgment, get an eternal body, and then go to the regions of the lost to be tortured throughout the feast of age of eternity and scream for mercy with a voice that will never get hoarse and pray for thousands of years a prayer that will never be answered but he'll never quit praying. I'm telling you, the true saints of God want judgment. They want the truth. They want the truth. And the truth Rightly divided is the only thing that will build the walls where they'll stand. You take me around to compromising places. They was places where the wall was built right. And they stood. But when compromising set in, the message changed. They begin to crumble. Begin to crumble. On today, my friend, many of them, you can't tell them from Babylon. And when they get in that shape, you never hear the message come out of it. So there's no place to bring them. No place to bring them. So may God help us tonight. I've hurriedly dealt with the spirit of compromise. It raised up at the cross. Come down and we'll believe. It's still working that way yet tonight. I trust that there's no heart in this building that's fostering such a spirit or harboring such a spirit as that. May God help you. Now I want to say again for the benefit of new people. I won't get up here and just hammering around on something. We want to teach it. Somebody said, well, you mentioned the encyclopedia. Well, we need to understand that everything is in the Bible is truth, but everything that's truth not in the Bible. 
history brings forth just as true facts as this. Now we form our lives after something. And the Revelation teaches us that the church of God on the 14th chapter of Revelation on Mount Zion, they're following the Lamb. Following the Lamb. Following the Lamb. But we need to realize where some of these things have begun. Well, somebody said, Brother Wilson, I feel I need to say this yet. Brother Wilson, do you think a little wedding band very narrow would hurt me? Now, just be fair with you. God is no respecter of person. If he lets you wear the wedding band, he must let the young person wear the class. Because neither one has any use. Not a bit of Bible for him. The Bible speaks against him. So God is just fair with all people. He deals with the wearing of gold for adornment. Now, come on, smile up. It may be several weeks before I have to preach on that again. Can't never tell. Then it might just be several hours. Just however God sees it. He wants us to build our lives according to truth, where we radiate out the very message of truth by the lives that we live. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy goodness, for giving us spiritual strength and physical strength to preach Thy Word again tonight. And Father, even as Thou hast led us to this message this evening, we know it's needed. Now we pray that Your solemnized hearts, my God, if there be those that need to measure, Make it clear to them. Let them know why they're doing what they're doing. That they'll be able to give a living testimony to them that would ask of the reason of the hope that lies within them. To be those here tonight that doesn't know thee dear to their soul. Help them to get a glimpse of the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Lord, we ask you to rebuke the enemy of souls. We felt tightness two or three times. We know the devil gets stirred when we preach along these lines. But we pray you rebuke him. Not let him have a lot in their part. May he be not able to hinder anyone in their forward march for thee. We ask in Jesus' name you'll reach out with your great and mighty hand towards every need in our midst. May they feel the reaching, drawing power and come unto thee and be saved. In Jesus' name we ask it. Let us stand. Lord Jesus, I long to be I didn't realize I was following that kind of practice. Well, you go into the Catholic hospital tomorrow, or go into the convent, and you'll see every nun there have on a wedding band just like yours. Even though she's promised she'll never marry, she's wearing a wedding band just like you got. When you look into the depth of it, you'll find that she claims she's the bride of Christ. She's had a wedding gown. She went through a wedding ceremony. And the Pope wears the matching ring. Then if you look on into the depth and see the ungodliness that goes on after that ring is put on that hand, you'd know what you're pattering after. I want to say again tonight, somebody said, well, how's a married woman going to keep herself 
Set apart, there's only one protection for a married woman. Act like one. You act like a married woman and nobody but a drunk or a fool will ever bother you. That's right. But you can have all the rings they can pile on you. If you don't act like a married woman, somebody going to get smart with you. They just stray. See, friends, those things were carried out of heathenism. Many people get so wrapped up in it, they feel their marriage rests on that. It's got nothing to do with it whatsoever. Love flows from heart to heart. And there's a way where everybody in your neighborhood and everybody that knows you can know you love your husband and are true to your husband. I've often said my wife never did have a ring. We've been married. She'll have to come here and tell you. 28 years or 29 and if you, you look around here real close, you'll see we're pretty well married. There's six little witnesses, and some of them are getting pretty good size when she never did have a ring. Lived with me on an army post where there's several hundred soldiers. Why, somebody said, I'd be afraid. You know, I'd be afraid if you act like you're married. These other things are just the enemy substitutes. Then, as the Bible said, the merchants of the earth has waxed rich off of them. They've built around that thing of love because it plays close to your heart. And they up the price up several hundred dollars for those things. If you really want to see what they're worth, when God shows you the truth and you take yours off, go back and see what he'll give you for it. Then you'll find out what it's really worth. forgiven you of your every sin and you're happy you've got peace and we thank God for it but the Bible plainly teaches you there's a second work of grace for you that even as God has saved your soul he's asked you to come and present your body a living sacrifice unto him and he'll take out of you that old carnal nature that raised up and caused you to commit sin in the first place fill you with his spirit You've tasted of His Spirit, He'll fill you with it. Fill you with it. When He fills you with His Spirit, everything else will be crowded out. And He says in His Word, in Acts 1 and 8, you'll receive power. After this, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses unto me. Then those that may have afflictions on your body, God in His Word declares He still wants to heal you. I realize every one of us can pray that where we're standing, but you may need someone to pray with you. Lord, I've been weakened by the powers that's working. Strengthen my hands tonight that I can work harder for God. Strengthen my hands. Just that last verse. I need to... oh, Jesus, thou feet thy face Amen. 